You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to another edition of the Film Literature and the New World Order podcast. And this month, as promised, we are talking about James Elroy's 1995 novel, American Tabloid, which was, in fact, the time book of the year for 1995, if that means anything to you. But more importantly, it was... Well, obviously, if you've read it, I think you'll see is a breathtaking work of incredible imagination. It's incredibly intricate. It's the kind of book I could probably reread five times and have to map out every character and everything that's going on. But just reading it uh, for the first time in preparation for this uh, edition of the podcast, I was certainly struck by the broad brush that James Elroy is painting with, but also the fine details he manages to work in there. It is quite an amazing work in a lot of different respects, and of course it swirls around the very types of topics that we're very much interested here at The Corporate Report, in, of course culminating in the moments before the assassination of JFK, and uh, the entire book is really the machinery that leads up towards that moment. It's, uh, again, a fascinating and very interesting work of historical fiction. And today I think we're going to be exploring what that line between history and fiction is and how Elroy manages to play with it. And in order to do that, we're going to bring on the program a new guest to the Corbett Report universe, but hopefully not a new person in the minds of Corbett Report listeners. I hope you are already familiar with the Dangerous History podcast at profcj.org, but if not, you will be now, so please go and check out that podcast. It is like a certain other well-known history podcast, except this one is from an anarchist bent. Yay! So it is exceptionally interesting from my perspective, and I do recommend it as a very valuable source of information on the real history that you don't tend to learn in the classrooms. So let's bring him on for this conversation. CJ, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Excellent. Well, it's great to have you here, and it is uh, especially nice that you you got in touch with me about this, and you suggested American Tabloid as a book that we should read for this podcast. And I'm glad that I took took that up, because it was obviously worth my time. But I'm always interested to find out, why did you want to do this book for this podcast? Well, I thought it was um, a perfect fit for obvious reasons that you know any anyone who's read it uh, could pick up on. And um, honestly, I was kind of surprised uh, looking at the back catalog of FLNWO episodes that it hadn't come up before. I was like, "Wow, this seems like you know such a such a perfect fit." Um, I love the book. I've now read it a total of three times, and it came along at a. Oops, I got a light around. It came along at an opportune time for me um, as I was making the transition maybe seven, eight years ago from kind of mild libertarianish person to full-blown anarchist. Um, I happened to discover this novel. I think it was – someone mentioned it on, on a Lou Rockwell article somewhere or something like that. And um, and, and I, I had read stuff by Elroy before, um, L.A. Confidential, maybe one or two other things, but I'd never read any any of these kind of more conspiracy-oriented novels. And I've always been a huge fan of hard-boiled uh, crime fiction. I, I love the genre and the fact that it was all this, you know, Kennedy assassination stuff and and all this power elite stuff. Really, I mean, that's it's kind of showing you the the nasty innards of the power elite, kind of told from the point of view of some of the gophers of of the real powers that be and it's it's so harsh and cynical of a novel that um it really appealed to me so anyway those are just some of the reasons i, th I think it's a great novel and i thought it would be a perfect fit for this show well, as people may or may not know, I do have a literary background, but I am not a, uh, a connoisseur of hard-boiled crime fiction. So I will confess this is the first Elroy novel that I've ever read, and I haven't even seen L.A. Confidential or any of the, the big-name oh. movies that have come out based on his books. So this is really an initiation for me, but obviously a good kick in the butt for me to start reading more of Elroy's work. Um, now let's, let's talk about that issue that I brought up, because obviously when people read the book, they will see that there are certainly real historical personages in here as characters in this story. Of course, the Kennedy brothers and uh, Jimmy Hoffa and people like this swirling around with these fictional characters who probably are more or less based on real people or amalgamations of real people like Pete yes. Bondurant and people like that. Mm -hmm. So let's let's start by getting a bit of James Elroy himself in an interview that he uh, gave back in 2009 talking about this and his view of history and fiction and historical fiction.
where does that come from? You start with, as you laid out a moment ago, the facts of history. Right. And then you have to fictionalize that. Yeah. What does that, it's come from the ether, where does that come from? History exists as subtext. You don't need to see Martin Luther King give the big speech. Right. I have a dream. You don't, not, we know, it's subtext. Right. It's there. Better to show him in a private context with fictional characters. It's more intimate. It gives you a sense of the private guy. What you have to create is the private infrastructure of big public events. When I was a kid, I always had a sense of some guy with a briefcase and a gun in it sitting outside the corridors of power. It's his story. What's he thinking about? Mm. The guys who implement public policy at the lowest possible level, what are they thinking about? What are their private lives like? Who are they in love with? That's history to me. All right, so that to me sounds like a certain phil uh, philosophical take on what history is, which is, again, quite different than I think the textbook boilerplate version of history that students are ten tend to be force-fed in the classrooms. But here we have, you know, Professor CJ of the, uh, the, the Dangerous History podcast. Tell me a little bit about how you react to James Elroy's description of history and, uh, and policy being enacted at the, by the lowest levels of the rung of the power ladder. I, I think it's an important perspective that hardly anybody ever looks at. You know, we've got the old traditional view of looking at the kings and the presidents and the generals. And then we've got um, ever since maybe the 1960s, we've got the more kind of bottom up Howard's in uh, social history. And, and that's all well and good. And, and those perspectives need to be seen. But, yeah, then you you kind of lose that that middle level of the people who are sort of on the front lines of carrying out the will of the power elite, you know, as, as important as it is to study the power elite themselves, um, I think that it's also important to look at these people who are actually going out there and doing stuff on their behalf, you know, because the, the guys who actually are the power elite, um, contrary to the portrayal on House of Cards or something, they're not actually – usually anyway, going out there and strangling people with their bare hands in a subway station or whatever. But, um, you know, they've, they've got various levels of flunkies on down the line. And um, I think it's one of the things that makes this book pretty unique is that it's from this point of view of these guys who are sort of flunkies for the powerful. Indeed, it does prevent, present a very different view of these types of events. And as I am going to argue, I think actually a more convincing view of something like a Kennedy assassination than you often get in, in any other approach. But before we get into that, let's talk about some of the actual history that underlies this book. Because, again, this is based on real events and real people and real things that really were swirling around in this time period, late 50s, early 60s. And, in fact, recently, or not so long ago, on the Dangerous History podcast, you did have a podcast about... Operation Underworld, the collaboration that we know is documentable and verifiable on the record between the Mafia and the intelligence agencies, the CIA forerunner and the CIA itself. Uh, extremely important and uh, uh, obviously connections that come up time and time again in the study of the JFK assassination. So why don't you just recap for us some of the, uh, the highlights of that collusion um, that, that underlies this book? Sure, yeah. It started during World War II where the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, which is actually a topic I'm planning on eventually doing an episode of my podcast on, because ONI, I think, gets uh, very much overlooked in American history. It's far older than the CIA. It, it, its roots run much deeper. Um, a lot of power elite families, you find them popping up in ONI. But uh, ONI made this alliance with the American branch of La Cosa Nostra for various reasons during World War II, um, including to try and get their help in the invasion of Italy and to try to get them because of their influence in the dock workers unions and so on to prevent the – and any of the um, the workers there from striking or or to ferret out any potential Italian saboteurs or whatever, uh, which turned out to not really be that much of a threat. But whether they believed it or not, that was their their rationale for this alliance. It included getting uh, Lucky Luciano out of prison early where he had been locked up for basically human trafficking, <laughs> um, you know, kind of a big deal. They, get, they got him off the hook and, and uh, then sent him to Italy. 
And um, this continued through the war, this this working alliance, and J. Edgar Hoover was kind of brought in on it and kind of told like – this is why J. Edgar Hoover then for decades publicly like a broken record kept saying La Cosa Nostra, the mafia, does not exist, which was a laughable statement. I mean anyone who lived in any of America's major cities could have told you not only that they existed but who they were and where they hung out. Um, and then afterwards, this alliance continued even after World War II. Uh, now, in the name of the Cold War, they uh, kept up this this alliance, these contacts between American intelligence and La Cosa Nostra, and you know books like uh, Alfred McCoy's uh, book on on the CIA and the heroin trade detail this continuing um, involvement, including you know into Vietnam and then later into Latin America, where. The uh, the intelligence network is is more often than not working very closely with organized crime. Now, in that episode of your podcast, which I I will put in the link, so I hope people will go and listen to it in its entirety. But you do leave the uh, the tantalizing little Easter egg for this conversation, in which you gesture towards a, a certain individual, Bob Mayhew, as the potential uh, pattern or or historical personage that. Uh, Pete Bondurant in this novel is based on. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about who is Bob Mayhew. Yeah, he's a very interesting guy, and he's um, – some people have also said they think he's also the partial inspiration for one of the other protagonists of the story, Kemper Boyd, that there's sort of elements of him in Kemper Boyd as well. But I, th I think more than anything, uh, Pete Bondurant, because of the Howard Hughes connection in, in American tabloid – um, Pete Bondurant is this gigantic French Canadian um, tough guy who's a former, I think, LA LA sheriff or something like that. Uh, I think Robert Mayhew in real life, if I, if I remember right, was former FBI. Um, but similar sort of a character, this former law enforcement guy, now kind of a freelancer. And Bondurant at the start of the novel is employed by Howard Hughes as kind of a, a fixer, a gopher. He gets Hughes. Um, drugs and things like this that Hughes wants, and he also um, is involved in running a tabloid to put out uh, Hughes's point of view. And a lot of this, if you look into the the real life character of, of Robert Mayhew, it's very similar. So I, I think there's no question that um, in in James Elroy's research that that uh, Mayhew was was one of the main inspirations for the character of Bondurant. Now, that is interesting, and I had that in mind when I was reading through the book, and then when I got to the passage in the book where they're talking about the uh, the loan that Howard Hughes made to Nixon's brother that became a big political issue in the campaign that, uh, against Kennedy in 1960, um, that Nixon later said was probably what cost him that campaign uh, when it was revealed that his brother had received this big uh, kickback basically from Howard Hughes and I, I went to, I immediately thought about that and thought about Bob Mayhew and Bondurant and I and I didn't know the, the history of this so I went and looked it up and uh, for example uh, 60 Minutes even did a piece on this 11 years ago called Watergate Aviator Connection question mark where they talk about uh, Bob Mayhew they talk to Bob Mayhew talking about the Hughes Nixon connection and uh, and ultimately how that led towards Watergate um, which is Obviously, uh, just sort of, uh, the, we, we see the embryonic stages of that story in this novel, although I do know this is part of the Underworld USA trilogy that does lead through um, uh, the Cold 6000 and Bloods, uh, Bloods of Rover towards the, uh, the Watergate. Yeah, yeah, although I, I've got to say, personally, the other two books in the series I did not like as much as American Tabloid. Um, I thought they got a little bit more sidetracked into just sort of like run-of-the-mill crime and kind of gradually got a little bit less focused on this sort of power elite type stuff. So, um, I, I actually might have gotten the uh, – I think I got the titles of those books wrong. <laughs> I think those are other books. But anyway, oh, no, I haven't no, no, read them no, yet. I, I, <laughs> No, no, no. Those are those are the oh, titles okay. of the next two books in the series. Yeah, okay. and uh, th those I've only read once a piece. I, I didn't like them quite as much as American Tabloid. But all right, well, let's let's get back to what I hope is my contentious statement that I think this is in many ways. I, I had the experience when I started to really get into the book and fall down the rabbit hole. I I had the experience of thinking to myself that this is in fact a more convincing 
portrayal of the things that led up to something like the JFK assassination than really any individual documentary or book that you can point a finger at, or I can point a finger at, because it strikes me, and it has always struck me, that events like the JFK assassination, massive events like this that have incredible import, generally, I, I can't believe that they happen for one particular reason and there's an easy you know one sentence summary of this person did this because this um i i tend to think it's because of a convergence of interests of a lot of different power entities that bring events like this about and i think this book goes a long way toward uh fleshing out what that actually looks like and i'm not alone in this uh i did find a a, a paper written by Isabelle Bouffe Vermes in Silage Critique, called James Elroy's American Tabloid Conspiracy Theory and Chaos Theory, that uh, begins this way. A few years ago, James Elroy picked up a copy of Libra, Don DeLillo's account of the JFK assassination, read it, and decided that it was so good he could never write a book about the most exciting crime ever. But the thought was unbearable. His next move was to cheat, to slightly change the focus. And then quoting Elroy, Wait a minute, I can write an epic in which the assassination is only one crime in a long series of crimes. I can write a novel of collusion about the unsung leg breakers of history. I can do a tabloid sewer crawl through the private nightmares of public policy. And then back to, uh, uh, back to the author. The main point made by American ta tabloid is thus that an event, even the most remarkable event ever, is not a singular occurrence, but something that is caught in a pattern. And I, I don't agree with everything that's said in the rest of this paper, but I thought that was a quite striking way of looking at this. And I think that encapsulates what I'm trying to say here is that it is, I think, exceptionally important not to encaps try to encapsulate an entire event down to one very easily, uh, uh, what can I say even, one, one, one little, timeline that you can tie a bow on and it's easily explainable um, this shows that no an event like this explodes in a thousand different directions that was the experience that i had when reading this book and i'd like to see what your take is on that yeah i, I very much agree with that and i think he does a great job in the book of you know how sometimes in between the narrative chapters he'll have these uh, fictional primary source excerpts where it's, uh, you know, a, a recorded conversation between J. Edgar Hoover and somebody or a, a record of a mafia uh, conversation that was being bugged or something like that. And, and how he kind of indirectly illustrates this growing convergence leading up to November of 1963, where increasingly these different factions, whether they're in the FBI, whether they're in the CIA, whether they're... Um, you know, in, in in the mafia, these these different factions are kind of all simultaneously coming to the same conclusion at the same time for their own specific reasons of JFK's got to go. And he even says a few times when he's kind of talking about the uh, the thoughts of some of the protagonists in in the novel, he says something along the lines of, uh, "Yeah, the the hit was in the ether. You know, the getting rid of Kennedy was just kind of in the in the zeitgeist almost." And I think that's important. That's one of the things that I really love about this book is that it really brings together the convergence. You can tell that Elroy did a ton of research. I, I was watching uh, an interview with him recently talking about this book in which he said his outline for this novel was 400 pages. So <laughs> that's that's some serious research. And he he really does a great job of showing this convergence of the mafia – intelligence, particularly the CIA, um, certain corporate interests, of course, the ubiquitous United Fruit Company, and elements of the FBI, including J. Edgar Hoover himself, who hated the Kennedy brothers, and um, how the, this all sort of came together. And it ties in as well to a book, um, perhaps you and, and some of the, uh, the listeners, the viewers are familiar with, a book from a while back called The Yankee and Cowboy War by Carl Oglesby, um, which which says, you know, if you want to understand American uh, politics and what's really going on from, say, maybe the 50s through at least the late 70s, 
you need to look more at kind of region and financial affiliation rather than at parties per se. And so he says, look, you've got the the, the group he calls the Yankees, who are sort of your northern blue bloods, your Harvard skull and bones guys, and you know your Kennedys and Rockefellers. And then you've got the Cowboys, who are these sunbelt guys from Florida and Texas and Arizona and California. And that there's this kind of feud going on. And this is why two guys like, for example, um, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, though they're both Democrats – hated each other with a passion because Johnson's a cowboy and, and uh, you know, JFK was a Yankee and that there's this back and forth battle going on between these two groups. And what I think is, is apparent in American tabloid is that the, all these different groups came together against Kennedy. Um, and it was basically the cowboys, you know, along with the mafia. Um, but it's basically the cowboys. It was these, these, su- these sunbelt guys, um, Howard Hughes and, you know, all these characters who basically decided that, uh, you know, Kennedy had to go. Right. And Kemper Boyd being uh, a good liaison for that group um, to work his way into the Yankee group, as it were, um, as a representative. Yeah, yeah he's 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 a fascinating character, Kemper Boyd. I mean, he's like such a. Um, you know, playing all sides at once, right? He's simultaneously working for the Kennedys, loving the Kennedys, and yet working with Hoover against them at the same. I mean, it's just he, he's such a wonderful, working for, yeah, working yeah. for everyone, working for everybody at once. What a wonderfully Machiavellian kind of psychopathic character. Which again strikes me as probably closer to the to closer to reality than is often portrayed in simplistic narratives of events like these, where. You know, this person was CIA and was doing this task, as opposed to a real human being who's probably, yes, embedded in all sorts of different things that are going on simultaneously that might converge towards another thing. And another aspect of this is the kind of blindness that people within the functioning of what becomes this plot have to the, the, the scope and reach of this plot. Different characters from different vantage points see different p- parts of it, but it doesn't mean that they understand the whole, and of course they don't know everyone what everyone else is thinking and what else is being planned, which culminates, of course, in these these guys getting set up, uh, essentially, for to take the hit for the assassination by plotting a, uh, an assassination that would never go ahead in Miami. Which also yeah, yeah. ties into an interesting part of JFK lore, which is that there was a second assassination plot in Chicago that was planned for before uh, the Dallas main event, which hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but a little bit more in recent years. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of those aspects, the kind of compartmentalization that I think, again, comes up as a specific word in this book. Yeah, it's one of the key concepts of the whole thing. And you're right. I mean, he has he puts that word in the mouth of, I think, all three of the main protagonists on multiple occasions. I mean, they're even joking with each other at one point about compartmentalization, because, as we said, everybody's working for multiple people at the same time or multiple uh, factions at the same time. Yeah, compartmentalization. I think that's that's the key is. Uh, people who who want to believe that the Warren Commission is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, one of their arguments is, well, how could you keep a secret that you know would have to be this big among this many people? And I think the answer is compartmentalization, that very few people would have known the whole picture. They would just know like their one little thing that they're doing. And they might not even in, in many cases, they might just be playing the part of useful idiots. They have no idea that they did some sort of little task that helped grease the wheels of either carrying out or covering up something like this. And so I that's another thing that I think is um to Elroy's credit that he really, you know, did his research and thought this through. Um, before he ever wrote the first chapter of the novel itself, that he really kind of figured out um, how this thing likely would have plausibly worked in real life. Right, and and we see another gesture towards that, I think, with the uh, the the murder of the uh, the boy at the homosexual uh, outside the homosexual club where Ward Little is uh, surveilling a mafia uh, figure, and he sees the the murder of this boy and knows what really happened to him, and uh, he ends up giving his uh, his mother uh, an anonymous. $5,000 or $10,000 or whatever it is, um, because this is a boy who died for uh, specific reasons that 
the family would never understand even if they saw what had happened. I mean, it's it's this network, this mesh of different events that lead towards the death of their son that they would even, wouldn't even wouldn't even begin to be able to understand. And in some ways, I think that's kind of the microcosm of the JFK assassination itself. Yes, we have this moment in time where this thing happens, but there's so many different aspects to what's going on and so many different players. And not only compartmentalization, but then you also have kind of a Mexican standoff among the people who at least know what the plot is and what's going on whether metaphorically or literally, that they all have skeletons, they can all pull the trigger uh, one way or another, whether that's through the press or through a literal trigger, um, on the other players who are involved here. They're all at each other's throats, which makes it even less likely that any one of them would come forward to spill the beans, spill their own participation in it, really. Yeah, plus many of them then also go around eliminating each other after the fact. So, uh, dead men tell no tales. Indeed. Well, uh, let's let's hone in on another theme of this book that might get lost in the, the kind of JFK and interesting, you know, conspiracy aspects of it, which is the title itself has to be a clue into the window of what this book is about at some level, American Tabloid. It is about this uh, Pete Bondurant, who, amongst other things, is also co- collecting uh, gossip for Hush Hush uh, uh, Howard Hughes' gossip rag, um, which is an interesting sideline to be in. And when you think about it, really would involve connections with a lot of shady underworld characters. So it makes sense that uh, someone like Bondurant would be doing this. But I think that provides another window into what's really going on here, which is the way that these big power elite use the spreading of information and disinformation and veiled threats and propaganda, even completely out in the open in this publicly available scandal rag, which may have pieces of the puzzle to something like the JFK assassination that the general public could read but not really understand. And it's mixed in with a bunch of other disinformation and nonsense so that people wouldn't even see what's coming. What do you think about the the, the centering of this book on that title of American Tabloid? Yeah, I, I think it shows that what Elroy's trying to do is to kind of give a, a glimpse of a plausible depiction of what the, the sordid underbelly of America really was. Um, let me just read a few lines from the introduction to the novel that I, I think reveals this right off the bat, um, even before chapter one. He, he writes, America was never innocent. We popped our cherry on the boat over and looked back with no regrets. You can't ascribe our fall from grace to any single event or set of circumstances. You can't lose what you lacked at conception. Mass market nostalgia gets you hopped up for a past that never existed. So I I think the whole tabloid metaphor and the function of it in the story is that way. It's like people have this this nostalgia either for the 50s or for Camelot and they think oh that's when every everybody was honest and upright and you know leave it to beaver was was a real depiction of most people's lives and whatever um but it's not you know it, it's it's been pretty dysfunctional um all along and and specifically to the point of of the tablet i think it's it's very interesting how they sort of use it um to kind of mix little bits of the truth here and there with disinformation and to do it in such a way and in such a publication that nobody from kind of serious mainstream society would take it seriously. You know, oh, that's the same, that's the same magazine that last week was saying that like Robert Kennedy, um, I don't know, uh, fathered 20 children with a black woman or, you know, just some, some ridiculous uh, nonsense. Um, and it does always make me wonder, too, whenever I'm waiting in the checkout line at the supermarket and I look at one of those really goofy tabloids, I always wonder, like, what if what if 10% of what's in there is actually accurate and the rest of it is just sort of camouflage? Which, you know? which if I remember correctly, was actually part of the movie Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson. Wasn't that one of his things he was saying? Yeah, they put real oh, stories yeah. in there as a way. And it's supposed, yeah, we're supposed yeah. to laugh at that. Oh, this crazy guy really believes the national Yeah, I report. think you're right. I think you're right. And and if I'm not mistaken, there might have even been something about it in the movie Men in Black as well, mm. where where they at one point referenced that some of the stuff in the tabloids was true. But anyway. Well, while we're quoting uh, uh, good lines, and that, that was a beautifully written passage there at the beginning, but uh, a couple of lines d- definitely stood out to me. One is, facts can be bent to conform to any thesis, which yeah. is, uh, I, I think, again, another 
kick in the teeth towards the the kind of nice you know all wrapped in a single package with a nice bow on it kind of thesis that people come up with for something like the jfk assassination when there's multiple different angles um and multiple different power elite that are converging on something like that um another one that also stuck out with me those we understand are those we control Mm. which again puts the the real uh, puts an incredible amount of power in the hands of the people who are listening which is again another huge theme of this book the bugging trying to bug all of these rooms bug J- uh, jack kennedy and his various affairs that it's always having that that power over somebody by knowing knowing more about them than than most other people would yeah yeah and the depiction of j edgar hoover um really i mean he's 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 positively a luciferian character in this story i mean he he kind of is everywhere and knows what everybody's doing and he he knows what the um protagonists of the story are going to do before they know it themselves in a way um it's it's such an ominous depiction and yet based on what we know of j edgar hoover seems quite plausible you know seems quite accurate to who he really was and how he operated well, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about this book now. I guess we should actually talk a little bit about kind of the thesis of the JFK assassination, such as it converges here, um, which swirls around the CIA and the mafia and the anti-Castro Cubans, as are generally these these players that come up in the JFK assassination story. Um, one element of this that I didn't see focused on as much as other uh, narratives would is the military side of it and some of the the military people who would generally be pointed at and uh, you know what was going on in Vietnam and things like that as a potential uh, uh, trigger point for for this assassination to go ahead but let's uh, let's hear your take I, I assume this is a subject that you've looked at before what what do you think this uh, this novel represents well or doesn't represent that well about what we know about what actually occurred in the run-up to the JFK assassination yeah, I think that's a good point that you bring up that the the, the novel didn't didn't really get into the military connection much. Um, the thing is, there's so many different factions that hated Kennedy for so many different reasons that it's so difficult to say, especially at this point with how many years have gone by, how many witnesses have died untimely deaths, and how many no doubt you know documents that have just been destroyed that will never be released even in a hundred years. Um, I don't know if we'll ever be able to say with 100% certainty every every last detail of exactly who was involved in what way. Um, but I, I think it seems plausible that the the military, you know, all the stuff having to do with um, the the disappointment in Kennedy from the top people at the Pentagon for not invading Cuba and for not um, you know amping up Vietnam as quickly. But the novel does do a good job with the CIA angle, I thought, and with the the Bay of Pigs connection. And and I think that seems likely to be an important part of whatever the real story ultimately is with the assassination of Kennedy. Um, I think it does do a good job with the mafia angle. It depicts a lot of the most important mob figures of that time period. You know, you've got Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante and Carlos Marcello and all these guys um, are important players in the story. So I think that's that's well done. I, I think the depiction of these kind of rogue agents whose loyalties are always questionable, I think that's probably an accurate depiction of how a lot of these sorts of characters would have been. And again, I think the depiction of Hoover is probably pretty close to the truth. Um, the way that J. Edgar Hoover, my perception has always been, I, d- I didn't think, that, I've, I've never thought that J. Edgar Hoover was like the main guy uh, pulling the strings, causing Kennedy to be assassinated. But um, my impression has always been kind of what's depicted in the book, that that he wasn't really the one making it happen, but that he was nonetheless friendly to the idea because he hated the Kennedys and he had a good relationship with Lyndon Johnson already going back for years. And um, that as in as in many other cases, Hoover knows something is is afoot that if he was an honest FBI director who's really just trying to enforce the law and create justice, he could easily, you know, make a couple phone calls and have the thing um, shut down and have all the players arrested because he's tapping everyone's phone and bugging everyone's house. But um, but he chooses to let things happen that are to his benefit. So I, I thought that was a strength of the book. Um, let's see. Other than that, I don't know. I'm trying to trying to think of any other weaknesses uh, of the book in regard to 
historical accuracy. I don't know. Do you have any in mind? Well, not really. And to be fair to the book, I don't think it closes the door on the military angle. It's just that that's clearly not what these characters are swirling around. That's not the stew that they're stewing in. But I don't think it closes the door to the idea that there's those... In fact, if anything, it blows the door wide open that there's people involved in this that they don't know that have their own stories. You could write another 600-page book about that. I think that's the effect of this. And uh, I, I think it brings home the point that I've thought about before that... To a certain extent, yes. I mean, who who pulled the trigger, or more accurately, who pulled the triggers, is at this point, I'm sure, a an undecidable question. I'm sure whatever evidence actually existed has been long since taken care of, and there's enough muddying of the waters that we'll probably never be able to decide that definitively. But in some ways, I think this book goes to show that that is probably the least interesting question about the whole JFK assassination. It's like 9-11. People get so 100% focused in on the buildings and the collapse of the buildings that they miss the huge scope of the picture of what was taking place on that day that was just one moment in a a huge tableau that was uh, unfolding with all these types of people. So I, uh, this is not, I guess, the forte of James Elroy, but I, I think this would be an excellent model for someone who wanted to write a book about 9-11 to use, um, because I'm sure you could do something of this scape, scale and scope with a, an event like that as well, and many other events in history. Maybe in 40 years, somebody will do a, do a historical 9-11 uh, crime novel. Well, if no one else steps up to the plate, I guess I'll have to. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> just the thought of writing a book like this is so so mind bending. Yeah, I'll I'll get to work on that 400 page uh, outline. Yeah, yeah, Elroy's a fascinating character. I mean, he's a true eccentric and a bit of a recluse and among other things, I mean, he doesn't watch TV, he doesn't he says he doesn't even own a computer. I mean, this is the explanation of how a guy could write a 400 page outline and then write an almost 600 page book with all of this historical accuracy and all this super intricate plot is that this guy does what (laughs) what none of us seem able to do he unplugs he unplugs and it gives him almost like superhuman i'm sure he's got like just an ungodly attention span (laughs) that's a very good point and yes he is an interesting character i hope people will check out some of his interviews um i was looking at one in preparation for today's talk where they were uh it was just an excerpt of a longer interview where he was talking about uh his uh, his work as a whole but in this little clip he was talking about uh john kennedy and how he was part of the cashew club because he was hung like a light switch and being quite crass but uh, but perhaps historically accurate about uh, jfk and talking about his pill popping and all of that kind of stuff and it was interesting because obviously james elroy speaks in a similar style to the way he writes very crass Mm -hmm. and very in your face and the it was interesting to see the comments in that video because they were almost universal universally deriding this and saying this is this is terrible and how dare you say that about john f kennedy and there still is this cult of kennedy that really does exist in the minds of so many people including in a lot of the alternative media that kennedy is this revered figure who could not have been involved in anything shady himself because he was martyred and uh yeah i i think that you know again this type of book brings that that type of narrative into question yeah, I think that's that's a wonderful point to make because, yeah, I'm I'm a bit put off by it as well. It's not to say that Kennedy didn't have maybe some some good things that he was going to do in regards to possibly uh, edging out of Vietnam, possibly eliminating or at least you know significantly reforming the CIA or whatever. Not to say that there weren't some good things he was maybe up to that that got him killed, but. The notion – like everybody wants to do to do a, a, a dichotomy where like if if really bad characters kill someone, that must mean their victim was a saint and you know was this wonderful hero and the myth of Camelot and all this sort of thing. And no, I mean the fact that, that the, the people who uh, seem likely to have been behind his murder may have been worse and may have done some, some very bad things in the aftermath of it doesn't mean that Kennedy himself was this wonderful great guy. Um, he definitely, you know, had his his problems as a as a character and as a public figure. Indeed. Well, uh, again, I have to thank you for bringing this book to my attention. There's so it's so good to see 
at least that this type of idea that I've had for some time now comes uh, can come through so clearly. And I've thought this specifically about the OKC bombing. I know that the mm. official story we've been told is not the way things happened, but mm -hmm. I don't presume to know what happened and who knew what, because I've, I've had the conscious thought before that if you actually were a fly on the wall, even following someone like McVeigh around, you wouldn't know what was happening because of all the different characters he was consorting with and where they were going and all of that. So... I've had this thought before, and this book is kind of the that that thought brought into fruition in a 600-page voluminous uh, novel. So I hope people have actually read it in preparation for this podcast. If not, please go, do go and read it, because this is this is exactly the way I would try to portray something like an OKC or a 9-11, because, again, these things are so much bigger in scope than, than what we tend to see in a nice, easy pat through line of a narrative for a documentary or what have you. Um, that's really, I think, what I wanted to say about this, but if there were any other points you wanted to make before we wrap up here. Um, no, I don't think I've got anything else to throw in. I think we've covered all the, the real kind of key ideas and points on this. Excellent. Well, uh, once again, I will direct people to your podcast generally, and of course, specifically to episode 117 on Operation Underworld that we mentioned earlier. Uh, lots of good information in that podcast and in the podcast generally for people who have not heard Dangerous History before. Shame on you, but <laughs> perhaps you can introduce them to it. What is it that you do? Yeah, well, I, uh, I've, I've got a bachelor's and master's degrees in, in history, and I've been teaching college history now for over 10 years. Um, but I gradually, over time, through the study of history, um, came to the anarchist position on, on you know, life and power and everything like that. And so um, I eventually just decided that there was I, – I looked around for it, but I couldn't find – a a history podcast that was from an anarchist point of view, you know, there's some great anarchist podcasts and there are some great history podcasts, but I couldn't find one that was both. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll start doing my own, I guess. And so far I've got the market pretty well cornered. So, you know, I, I found a niche and uh, jumped into it. So if you want to hear history, um, you know, a lot of American history, but I occasionally cover ancient and medieval topics as well. If you want to hear history that's not from a court historian point of view, that's not from the default position always being that the people in charge are benevolent and looking out for us and all this sort of thing. Um, if you want a point of view that's maybe a little bit more hard boiled, maybe a little bit more at least kind of in the spirit and attitude of James Elroy's take, um, my podcast, uh, maybe you should give it a give it a listen, see if you like it. Well, I hope people do that. And one thing I have to comment on before we go, uh, you've got the Bipcot no gov license on your site. Tell people about that. Ah, uh, yes. This this is a um, a, a form of kind of uh, creative commonsing, uh, creative commons licensing sort of a thing for for those of us who are libertarian anarchists who don't believe in the concept of intellectual property. And this was devised by Michael Dean of the Freedom Fiend show. And basically, it's it's kind of like um, open an open um, anti-IP sort of a license, but it specifically excludes governments and agents thereof, and it uh, opens them to ridicule if any any government or government agent um, you know wants to wants to plagiarize a bit of my podcast or or anything else that's Bip Bipcot licensed. So you know, kind, kind of a fun little yeah yeah. <laughs> Kind of a kind of a fun little you know middle finger to the man. I won't I won't you uh, exercise my copyright except for government. You can't take my word. yeah. I like that. All right. Well, let's leave it there. Once again, we'll direct people to profcj.org. Uh, CJ, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.